Hello and welcome to Chawton House's Lockdown Literary Festival. My name is Cleo O'Sullivan. I'm the Communications and Public Engagement Manager at Chawton House. And here with me today is Jill Hornby, best-selling author of Miss Austen. So we're going to talk a bit about that. Jill, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Thank you for having me. And, you know, it's great to be able to do something, isn't it? Well, it's lovely to see you. And you've been to Chawton House many times. You've been to the cottage where Jane Austen lived, now Jane Austen's house. You have visited Cassandra's graves. So even to the casual visitor, it's clear to see how much Jane Austen means to so many people. So my first question is, was there any trepidation in recreating Jane Austen's voice in those lost letters that Cassandra burned? Absolute terror. <laughs> I, um, I set out to write a novel about Cassandra. You know, I very much wanted it to be her, her novel, her story. She was the main person because in the biographies, you know, obviously Jane is the heroine and Cassandra is a bystander and often very negatively viewed. So I wanted to make the case for Cassandra and I wanted to do it entirely from her point of view. But obviously because the two lives are so utterly interlinked, I couldn't um, ignore Jane. But I chose to start the novel after Jane's death, so it was very Cassie, 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 and I could major on that. And I kept putting off Jane's entrance all the time. And I realized, you know, I was delaying her and she really did have to come in and say something. Um, and that was the worst, actually, much worse than the letters, was making her as a character talk and think and chat and move and walk about the room and do stuff. That was what I found quite intimidating because in a way the letters are just an act of ventriloquism. But the um, actually creating her as a character out of the scraps of knowledge that we have about her, that was terrifying. So I'd sort of write a sentence and go, ah! and delete it and run away and walk the dog and come back. And then I think my gift was that I wasn't um, commissioned to write this novel. I was writing it and nobody was interested. So that was fine. Um, I didn't show it to anybody till I finished it. And then I just showed it to my husband and my agent. So I said to myself, look, probably nobody is ever going to read this. You're going to finish it and then you're going to burn it. And then that will be that. And then you can get on to something else. So with that sort of release, that, that made me, um, you know, it just disinhibited me in the process. So I just thought, well, I'll get going. And then once I got going, I couldn't shut her up. It was funny, you know, she became bigger and bigger and louder in my novel, much more than I didn't intend it. But of course her spirit is so strong and, and her character is so strong. And um, the voice, well, the voice that I have given her, that, that um, I have chosen for her, uh, was irresistible really to write. Um, so once that was done, it was fine. And then I sold it and there were a few letters from Jane and the editor said, we've really got to have more letters from Jane. <laughs> so I started churning them out a bit like a factory. And, uh, and then, and, and they were all happy with it, but of course they weren't Janeites. But then it went in manuscript form to various wonderful Janeites. Gillian Dow, who's part of this festival, and Deirdre Le Fay, who is the gatekeeper of everything. And once it had got through them, I felt a bit more relaxed. So, um, And where did your interest in Jane Austen sort of start? Because in, the, in Miss Austen, you really live and breathe the Jane Austen family. You feel like you're almost one of them, like all the sort of family dynamics and alliances and sort of miniature battles that every family has. I'm obsessed with them actually, but I wasn't, I wasn't. I mean, I came to the novels through school. I had an English teacher who changed my life in sixth form and she was a great Jane Knight. And so um, I read all the novels, but I never engaged with the life at all. I really didn't know anything about her except what everybody knows, spinster, dead, you know, that, that those were the two uh, facts of, of my knowledge. And then we moved to the village of Kimbury 27 years ago. And when we bought this house, everybody said there's an Austin connection. They used to visit here. It's not there. It's not the Fowl family's actual house. 
the one we live in, it's the on the it's got the footprint of it. Theirs was torn down in 1860, and this one was put up. But we've got the same cellar and the same garden and the same view. And all anyone said was Jane Austen visited this house. Then I found out that the actual connection was that Cassandra was engaged to the son of this house, and that was the and that it was a perfect match and that the family who lived here were best friends with the Austins and you know how great have your daughter marrying your the son of your best friend you know it's marvelous um and then tragedy had intervened and she'd never married and then she began to haunt me first before Jane did because I thought of her here her first Christmas away from her family, always a tricky time. <laughs> and um, it was her last Christmas with Tom and she had to wave goodbye to him in January, sort of at dawn. And, and he went off to join a ship and she never saw him again. Mm. And that really grabbed me. I mean, it's the stuff of 19th century novels, isn't it? When, when a woman has her destiny and then rumpf, it's gone. So, and then about, Eight years after that, I was commissioned to write a biography of Jane for the younger market, um, for eight to twelve year olds. And to write a short book, you have to know everything that would have to go into a long book, you need to know what to look at. And then that was when I became obsessed with all of them, but Cassandra in particular. Mm. In particular. Because um, Miss Austin is just a vindication of Cassandra, because you're right, she has just been character assassinated in all of the biographies and I think you said when you visited Shorten it's sort of any any situation if there are two women one has to be held up as the heroine one has to be the villain Jane Austen is obviously going to be the heroine she's the writer so Cassandra by contrast has to be this sort of they have to be compared mm. I mean of course the only reason any of us are ever talking about her Cassandra is she was she was the sister of a very famous person mm. but still it happens in families and and from the outside world to families all the time and what is it what interests me about their situation is that Cassandra was the eldest daughter she was the better looking she was the more organized her mother thought she was a marvel Jane had her on a pedestal Jane worshipped her mm. they were just these two girls and a sea of boys um, so naturally they were very, very close. But she was a great, great woman. She was clearly incredibly bright. She wasn't a world famous writer who redrew the whole English novel, but she was a bright woman who in our day would have done something significant. And she was very capable and she looked after everybody. And her great crime in everybody's view was that towards the end of her own life, ages after Jane was dead, she sat down and burnt nearly all of the letters between them. And my sadness is that she also sat down and burnt all of her replies so that she's, she's a very dumb person, you know, partner in silent partner in this, in, in the letters we've got. But from the letters, we learn how much Jane loves her, how much she depends on her, how much she values her judgment, how she misses her when they're apart. So that's Jane's evaluation of her. The biographers loathe her because of the, of, of the letter burning, and lots of people do, but of course Jane would have wanted it. Jane didn't tell anybody what she was up to. It was only Cassandra that she shared her secrets with. She wouldn't have wanted some great tell-all biography of, of what she went through and all the things she thought. And also, it's part of Jane's success that we know so little about her. We have no dirt on her. You can't dislike her like you can dislike Charles Dickens because of the way he treated his wife or something like that. You know, there is nothing. It's a, it's a driven snow kind of um, reputation that we've been given. And then you come to the family memoirs and they remember Jane as the Mrs. Perfect, Mrs. Blessed, Saint Jane. And for some reason they have to then, then be very disobliging about Cassandra. And the thing about Cassandra is she did everything for all of them. Mm. The way those two women earned their crust was by their brothers giving them money. And the reason the brothers gave them money was because when any sister-in-law was in labor or any old person was dying or any bug was going through the nursery, it was Cassandra they sent for. Mm. who went and looked after everybody and took charge of the nursery when mothers were confined and taught everybody their letters 
and the nurse has told Mrs. Austin to death. No thanks. You know, that's a really important thing. And this was an enormous family. So there are an awful lot of people who should feel grateful. And also it was an awful lot of work for her. But that gets my goat that, that our response as a society is always to the great person, the person who changes the world. Whereas the person who makes our world tick over, you know, the sort of women. And that we're seeing so much of it now with coronavirus, the sort of people who through the goodness of their heart and their own sense of responsibility keep things going for other people. These people are heroes too. Just because she hasn't written a world famous novel, it doesn't mean she's a person who deserves no respect at all. You know, that's where I'm coming from. Yes, I feel you do really, Any anyone who begins Miss Austen disliking Cassandra will come through being their biggest, being her biggest defender by the end. It's just, it's a real... I hope so. And I think Jane would want that because Jane certainly felt that she couldn't have done anything or been anything without Cassandra, which is another reason why the family and, and, and Janeites should be grateful because perhaps without Cassandra there would have been no novels, you know? Mm, absolutely. And I've got a question here from Mary Della on behalf of her daughter who studies A-level English and is a young writer. And she says, did you ever consider rewriting history in your story? For instance, allowing Cassandra to get married as part of the story, or do you want to just keep it to the fact? Well, I didn't because I think the crucial fact of Jane's life is that Cassandra never married, because if she had married, then Jane would probably have had to marry too. And if Jane had married, then she wouldn't have been able to write any novels. Mm. And so then the whole story falls apart in your hands. But I have rewritten history. There's a, the, an, a family anecdote of Jane falling in, love in the, falling in love at the seaside at the beginning of the 19th century. And that he was Mr. Perfect. And um, everybody was thrilled about it. And then, hey presto, he suddenly died kind of minutes later. <laughs> And when I think about that, I think there's so much Chinese whispers actually down from the family. And it's one of the things I just didn't believe because there's no evidence of Jane ever attracting anybody in her lifetime. And then, but there is evidence of Cassandra being, being seen as the sort of model wife. And so I thought, well, I'm going to give that romance to Cassandra and see what happens. Because it seems much more likely because really what are the chances that Jane fell in once, it fell in love once in her whole 41 years, and boom, he was dead minutes later. Um, it just seems kind of <laughs> particularly bad luck. So I gave it to Cassandra and made it a choice. So that was fun. And then the other thing, the reason why it was a very interesting bit of historical fiction to do um, was because by burning the letters, Cassandra left so many gaps in the story. Mm. And into that, I could put whatever I wanted. Yes, because people um, obviously I could set Jane's life story, of course. Yes, and people always fill the gaps with romances, don't they? They sort of I like do. Jane, Austen, Jane Austen House required um, acquired a letter a few months ago, um, which had a sort of it filled a gap in, and everyone was like, "Will it reveal a hidden romance?" And it was about a laundry bill or something. So. Yeah. Exactly. No, I, I think there wasn't any romance. And I keep reading the statistic about women in Jane Austen's time. And I've read it kind of 10 times. So I still can't believe it, that only 30% of women got married in the mm -hmm. first half of the 19th century. And therefore, you know, she wasn't unusual. Mm. In, uh, neither of them was unusual. And that, that the life of the spinster was the common life of those times, of the, of the 18th and 19th century, and the, and the struggle of the spinster, because unless you had money, and few of them did, then, then life was, was a question of, of finding your way through, you know, governessing, serving, teaching, you know, what can you do? Living together, as the Austen ladies did with their friend Martha and their mother, forming what a historian calls a spinster cluster to keep going. Um, this is the norm, so, you know, and if there had been a romance, she didn't have any money, Jane. She's unlikely 
you know, because men seem to have such a large pick of women, they tended to get for the ones that brought something in with the relationship. And, and Jane wouldn't have done, she never had anything. Mm. You know? I think that's what really, really comes across in Miss Austen is the peril of being a woman alone, unprotected and without money, which I think we in our modern sensibilities do take for granted to some extent. We take our education for granted mm. and we take our freedoms for granted. It's quite extraordinary when you think about it, um, what, what they went through, you know, and, and how few choices they had and how hard survival was. And of course, that's what Jane's novels are about. Mm. All of the heroines, apart from Emma, handsome and rich, that's the most crucial word in the, in the whole of Jane's novels. She's the only one who can make her choices. The rest of them, those Bennett girls, are in jeopardy, absolute jeopardy. And Mrs. Bennett is the only person who understands that. Mr. Bennett, sitting indolently in his study, doesn't realize that if he drops dead like that, then what's gonna to happen to those five? They're all daft. They're, they're, you know, all they can do is so. <laughs> They've got, they have no money. Of course Lizzie should be marrying Mr. Collins. She would have secured the whole family. Mm. Um, so, I mean, all of, all of, all of the, her heroines are delivered from penury by their romances. That, that's, what, that what, that's what brings the jeopardy in, in, into the narrative. Because, you know, if Anne doesn't, marry Captain Wentworth, mm. then what? She'll be Miss Smith in Bath. Exactly. There's always a Miss Smith or a Miss Bates sitting there as a kind of cautionary tale. Mm. Exactly. Mm. Um, this is a question from Ireland now, and it's, it's more about you than the book. Um, it's, how on earth did you manage a home husband who is also a prolific author and your children? Um, because lockdown has given this questioner a good insight into the strains and stresses of parents trying to work from home. Yes, I wrote this, but I've had four children and I have to say, when I had four under 10, I didn't do anything at all. I, well, I, re I wrote book reviews when the baby was napping and the next one up was at nursery school and that, re I did book reviews for the times. And, but that was all I managed in the first sort of 10 years. When the youngest went to junior school, that's, I started writing a column and then, no, uh, infant school and then junior school, I got sacked from the column and that's when I wrote my first novel, The Hive. But you know, I only wrote it in the school day and term times. I wrote, I wrote it in five terms between 9.30 and three. And I found it easier than lockdown. Lockdown, I find the day is so huge. Mm. I am not managing to command my time properly. I mean, I found my youngest left home last summer and I felt myself sort of slightly falling to bits then. And because I'm very, I'm quite obedient, but I'm very bad at sort of self-discipline. So the whole time I had children in school, everyone was at school on time, everybody was in a uniform, everyone had to be clean. Homework was more or less done if I could catch them. But one, now I've got none of that discipline coming in on me from, from outside. I wake up in the morning and I think, oh, well, I don't have to start yet, I'm going for a walk, I'm going to have coffee. Oh, I mean, I enjoy this novel. I've got all day, you know, and then you feel the day. So I found actually that that discipline of just having one, a small box in the day to get everything done was better for me. Mm. What can I say? Yeah. Um, however, I mean, I thank my lucky stars now that they are grown up and I don't have four under 10 at home now. I don't know how people are coping. Yes, I mean, there's been quite um, a, humorous, a humorous reaction to lockdown online, um, comparing it to the etiquette of Jane Austen. I don't know if you've seen that sort of um, keeping your distance, sort of distance, yeah. touching surfaces, but always wearing gloves, asking if your family is in good health. Do you think in a way, in a sort of twisted way, this is kind of giving us an insight? Into, yes. Yeah. It, absolutely. I'm reading, I'm writing another novel set in the 19th century now, and I don't find it any kind of a leap because 
life is utterly socially distanced. And also they lived with the ever present fear of contagion. Mm. So we've always had this idea until now that yeah, mothers died in childbirth and yeah, you had 11 children, but only one of them came through it. But they were used to it. It wasn't the same. Now we know when people are dying every single day that it doesn't matter how many, you know, it doesn't matter if your husband is part of the statistic or your mother is in a care home, but she's one of thousands in a care home. It's part of humanity to care passionately about every tragedy. And so, and that's what they lived with in the 19th century. The things came through in waves, the smallpox, the cholera, the t then the TB, all the rest of it. They lived with it. We now live with it. We understand it. I mean, my brother's got a new book coming out in September and I just read it. And he wrote it obviously before lockdown. And everyone's snogging and going to bed with strangers and going to the pictures. And I'm like, wow, this is like science fiction. No one's going to believe this. I can't do that. <laughs> Whereas Ms. Austin, you know, oh yeah, we understand that. Hmm. I mean, I was thinking earlier, actually, Martha Lloyd, the Austin's great friend who lived with them at the end in Shorten, she came from the next village to hear Enborn. And she was born in the middle of the 18th century when scarlet fever, the smallpox, was, smallpox was the thing. There was a terrible outbreak in Newbury. So Enborn went into lockdown, what we now call lockdown. <laughs> it went into lockdown and they were all... She was the vicar's daughter, she, and there were three girls and then a little boy. And the vicar and his wife, they locked down. And then a coachman came to the house and he swore that he'd had no connection with any smallpox. But the next week, it ravaged the whole family. And all of the Lloyds, Mary Lloyd, who became Mary Austin, Martha Lloyd, who became Martha Austin, and Eliza Fowle, who lived here in Kimbury, they were all affected by it. And, and Mary and Martha had terrible marks that the precious boy child, the fourth child, the long for son, didn't make it, he died age seven. So it's interesting, isn't it? You know, mm. we're back again. We're back living with what they lived with. Yes. And even just the stresses and strains of having a full house as well and all the sort of housework and everything. That really yes, needs. absolutely. And, and living en famille and really not having the release of a constant... And, you know, I've got, I've only got two of my kids at home, but they shouldn't be, you know, they're sort of 19 and 23. It's a very different experience when they come back than when you're able to control them more and tell them what to do. Um, but of course, that was the norm in those days that you lived at home until you got married. So, <laughs> 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 it won't go on too long. They're certainly never going to find spouses in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We sort of write long distance letters and hope for the best, but sort of <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got time for one more question. And um it's it's actually about your audiobook, which I listened to as well, um, just as sort of when you came to visit Chawton in February. I'd read your book over summer, but I wanted to remind myself. And it's Juliet Stevenson who uh, narrates it. She's so brilliant. She's obviously Mrs. Elton in the film version of Emma um, with Gwyneth Paltrow, and she's done loads of Austin recordings. So I was wondering, do you have any say in that, or do they sort of say, do they just... I didn't know. Well, I could have had a say, I suppose, but the first thing I was asked was, Juliet Stevenson is really keen to do it. Are you happy with that? So <laughs> I said yes, because I thought it was amazing that she yeah. was going to do it, because she's also read all the Austins as well in the in the audiobook so no I mean I was absolutely thrilled she's perfect and there are so many voices there are so many generations and different times and different classes and so on and she's well, I mean she's amazing she does a good Caroline build she does a good Caroline Austin as a sort of um um Cass oh. and that sort of really gets your revenge across there of Caroline saying horrible things about Cassandra. Yes, I, I have to give Caroline for what she says about Cassandra. Exactly, and Juliet Stevenson does decimate her quite nicely. So, <laughs> well, unfortunately, I could talk to you for hours and hours, Jill, but I'm, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. But if you have tuned in to us live, then you move over to Twitter now, then Jill will be there at the ready to answer any lingering questions you might have. And Miss Austin is available in 
all good open bookstores and uh, you can buy the ebook online as well. So thank you so much for joining us and we will see you later on. Bye-bye.